<clears throat> During this Advent sermon series, we've been following the Gospel of John, as it showed us, shows us a kind of a <coughs> heavenly view of the Christmas holiday. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke give us the, the more earthly stories of the wise men and the shepherds and so on. John gives us this, he sort of zooms out and gives us this heavenly view of what Jesus' birth means from heaven's perspective. We've seen that the good news of Christmas offers us a new creation, that it gives us a new purpose for our lives, reminds us who and whose we are. And today we see that Christmas also gives us an entirely new family. So let us pray. Holy God, we are grateful for your word to us this morning, for the chance to read and reread these Christmas stories from Scripture. We pray that you take this word to us this morning, plant it deeply within our hearts, and cause it to grow and bear fruit in our lives for your kingdom. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. The scripture I'm reading today is from John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. And John says, speaking of Jesus, the true light which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not <coughs> receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Again, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christmas is a time for family. Kind of stating the obvious, right? Christmas, the holidays, this whole season is a time for family. It's a time for visiting family, for getting together with family. We do whatever it takes, if we possibly can, to get together with family <coughs> this time of year. We have kids that are in college who come home during the break to spend time with family at Christmas. We have relatives and cousins and siblings who fly all the way across the country or drive long distances. We prepare large meals and have leftovers for weeks, all because we are doing everything we can to get the family together. That's what Christmas, at least partially, is about. It's what we do. It's a time for getting together with family. Now, the importance of family this time of year during the Christmas holiday <coughs> is simultaneously a source of great joy and great frustration and even sometimes deep pain for us. It's both at the same time. The joy part is obvious. We love these people. We love these people more than anybody else on earth. We want to be with them. We want to get together with them. And, and around the holidays, we are reminded that deep down we know these people are more important than any of the other stuff in life. More important than the presence, more important than work, more important than success, or, or whatever else is going on. <clears throat> These people are more important. And so we get together, we have deep joy in that. But at the same time, this same family, these same people, can be the cause of anything from just a little bit of annoyance, when we spend too much time with them, to also a source of pain, a, face of, a, a source of hurt. This is a very difficult time of year for many of us, and for some of you in particular. And it could be, it could just be that someone in your family isn't going to make it for Christmas this year. Maybe they're visiting someone else, or travel plans didn't work out, whatever. And so it's not a big deal, but you won't see them this year for Christmas, and you're a little bit sad about that. It could be that there was a fight in your family between one or two or, or all the members of your family and, and tensions are still running a little high and you're either not going to get together because of that or you're, you are still going to but you're really not sure how that's going to go. This could be the first Christmas that the person who has always hosted it doesn't have the health to host it this time. So you're changing plans and there's a sadness to that. And of course, of course, this time of year is difficult whenever we grieve the loss of a loved one, someone who won't be with us this year, maybe this year for the first time. It's just part of this time of year. 
family is simultaneously a source of great joy, but also deep pain. And really, that shouldn't surprise us, because that happens any time we allow ourselves to love people. We open ourselves to both deep joy and deep pain. Well, the way John tells the story of Christmas, the original Christmas, the incarnation of God born in the manger in Jesus Christ, is a story of God visiting his own family at Christmas. That's what it's about. It is a story, an act of visitation. God becoming human, going to be with his own, as John says, in human form. To relate directly to us. To dwell among us, as he's going to say later on in, as we go through the series. Christmas is about God visiting his very own family. His family that he has created. But like all families, this human family, all of us, has its own share of dysfunction. And the main dysfunction that we have <coughs> is that over the course of history, we have become estranged from God. We have become strangers to this God who made us. It goes all the way back to the story of Adam and Eve. God created them, said, don't eat this fruit. They rebelled against God, they ate it, and from then on, we are still loved by God, but we are also enemies of God. We want to do our will and not God's will. We, we rebel against God, and that's, that's the sin that's within us, this disease that we call sin. It estranges us from God. It makes us strangers <coughs> within our very own family. That's why John says that Jesus Christ visited us. We were such strangers that we didn't even recognize him when he came. Is God who made us came to us, we didn't even know. John says, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Could you imagine going to your kid's house for Christmas this year only to find out at the front door that you weren't on the guest list? <laughs> that they don't even want you there? That you weren't invited maybe? That they don't even recognize you? Not only would that be awkward, that would be extremely hurtful. Can you imagine what Jesus' life was like? Coming to his own and having his own not even know him and not receive him. We are estranged from God and oftentimes we're estranged as siblings within our own family from each other. <coughs> and there are a couple of ways that this estrangement happens over time and, and John kind of speaks to both of these here. The first way that he mentions is that we can become estranged when we no longer know who our family members are. John says the world did not know Jesus when he arrived. We become estranged when we don't know who our family members are. When you don't know who your family is, if someone asks you, hey, who's your family? And you don't know how to answer them. You feel isolated. Not just from within whatever family you may have had in the past, but from the rest of the world, you feel like you're by yourself in this world. You feel like you are on your own, like you have to fend for yourself. And the longer you feel like that, the longer you live that way, the more it becomes true. You do have to fend for yourself. You're on your own, you can take care of yourself, and that's no way to go through life. Without some kind of family to identify, to fall back on, you are on your own. After a while, you don't trust anybody. You become comfortable with the estrangement. Not knowing who your family is makes you a stranger to just about everyone, sometimes including yourself. Now, some people don't know who their family is in a literal sense. You don't know who your family is. Maybe you don't have parents that are living anymore, and you were an only child, and you don't really have relatives that you know of, maybe you don't even have a close group of friends. You, you literally don't know who your family is. You can't identify people that play the role of family in your life. That's one way that we might not know who our family is. But there's another way that we don't know or come to not know who our family is, and that's by choice. So one way is we just don't know. We literally don't know. But the other way is by choice. When we opt out of the families that we have. We know who they are biologically. We know who our relatives are on paper, 
But at some point, somebody chose not to be part of the family. It could have been them choosing not to be part of your family, or you choosing not to be part of your family. And this is what John talks about when he says that Jesus came to his own and they did not receive him. Jesus came to humanity that he created, his own people, and they chose not to receive him, not to believe the things he said about himself, that he was one with God the Father, that he was God in the flesh. They said, no, we're not going to believe that. We refuse to recognize you as our God. They opted out family that they were part of. And when this happens in our families, when somebody opts out, it is incredibly hurtful. When a spouse abandons a marriage or is forced to leave because of abuse, when a child runs away with the wrong crowd, or when siblings emotionally disown each other and refuse to speak for years on end, when a church splits when your friends break their promises, these choices leave behind deep wounds on both sides that take a long, long time to heal. And if we're honest, we don't even always want them to heal because we've been hurt. People have said things to us. They've made choices opt out of a relationship with us that hurts. And we want to nurse that wound to justify our anger, our resentment, and our ongoing estrangement because it wasn't our fault. Sometimes we don't want the wound to heal. <coughs> when people choose not to receive their own family members, families get ripped apart. It's incredibly painful to be part of. It's incredibly painful to watch. <coughs> so families, Right? Simultaneously, a source of joy and a source of pain. And the odds are pretty good that at this point in my sermon, some of the things that I have said have probably struck a chord with most of you in this room. You can kind of identify, if not exactly, then pretty close to something I've said, some experience in your life or in your family. Because all of our families have some dysfunction. None of them are perfect. Some of us are better than other families at looking better on the outside. But we all have some dysfunctions, but because of the simple fact that we, our families, are made up of people. Right? Wouldn't family be so much easier if it weren't for the other people? <laughs> this affects all of us. This is true to some degree for all of us because all of our families have sinful people and there is some dysfunction. So isn't it wonderful news? Isn't it incredibly good news that at Christmas, Jesus offers every single one of us a new family. Not this earthly family that, again, has sinful people and is constantly prone to falling apart, becoming estranged from each other, but a family that is being every day woven more tightly together by the grace and the love of God. Isn't it wonderful news that there is a family like that for you and for me? John says, to all who did receive Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, <coughs> who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but who were born of God. A new family. And becoming part of a new family, this, this does not happen overnight, and it does not happen automatically. One of the things that I hear over and over and over these days is people talk about how we are all, as human beings, all of us on this planet are children of God. And before I say anything else, I understand the sentiment of that, and I totally agree. All of us are created by God. All of us are loved by God. Even our enemies are created and loved by God. But according to the Gospel <coughs> of John, children of God is a technical term that is reserved for those who have been adopted specifically through Jesus Christ. He says they've been given the right to become children of God. God doesn't, John doesn't say that Jesus came to his own because, well, we're just all children of God already. I mean, God loves us. He made us. But Jesus came to give us the option, the right to become children of God. And the way that we become children of God 
is not automatically, but through a process called adoption. <laughs> over and over throughout Scripture, this is an analogy that it uses to talk about our salvation, that we are adopted into the family of God. And I have to also say that adoption is not second-class membership in a family. I want all of you to hear this, whether you've been adopted or you've adopted your own children or have friends that have adopted children or whatever the case. Adoption is not second-class citizenship in a family. I actually think that adoption is the way all of us become part of our family, even our biological family. Because blood is not enough to make a family. And anybody from a broken home can tell you that. I think the process for all of us is a kind of adoption. And it's a two-part process. It begins with the first step when the family claims you as their own. <coughs> when you were born in that hospital room, you didn't have any choice in who claimed you as your own. Your parents or whoever else was there claimed you as theirs. This is my child, my family. That's an act of grace. You had no say in that. Before you could do anything right or wrong, you were claimed as a part of that family, and it's the exact same way in the family of God. John says that we're not born of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. God is the one who chooses us to be in his family. That is the first step in becoming part of the family of God. It's a sheer act of grace. Adoption begins in our baptism which is a sign of God saying, you're mine. I'm calling you my own. Coming part of God's new family is, a, is an act of sheer grace. That's the first step of adoption. The second step is then when we learn to act like a member of that family. Once we are adopted, we then adopt the family's way of life, just like a child who grows up and learns from his or her parents a certain way of doing things, a certain way of behaving. We then adopt the family's way of life. We adopt its values, its lifestyle, its beliefs, and its traditions. The traditions are important. The way things are done, the shared way of life in the family, that's what holds a family together. When people talk about traditional family and the value of traditional family, we can't just be talking about the structure, the traditional structure of two parents, husband and wife, 2.5 kids, and a golden retriever. I mean, that's... That's fine, that's great, but that's not what makes a family and holds the family together. What holds it together is not the traditional structure, but the traditions, the way of life that binds the family together. And I think this is what John's talking about when he says that we become children by believing in Jesus' name. He doesn't just say believe in Jesus, he adds this interesting idea of believing in the name of Jesus. Because I think with that name comes the idea of the identity, the way of life the way things are done in this family. After all, that's what a family name does. It reminds you who you are and whose you are. It's why when your kids get in trouble, you use their last name, right? <laughs> Robert Deck, you put that down right now, you know? <laughs> you use the last name because it's a way of saying, don't forget whose family you belong to. And in this family, we don't do things like that. We do things like this. The family name carries with it this idea of the way of life, our traditions, the way we do things, and it matters. Biology alone is not enough to create a family. It's the shared way of life. We are adopted as an, in an act of sheer grace, and then we adopt the way of life of the family. This is the new family that Jesus offers us at Christmas. And I'll add here as I get close to finishing up, this new family, this family of God does not replace the old family. This doesn't mean that we, we kick our family members out at Christmas and say, well, I'm part of the family of God, so now we don't do anything at Christmas. That's, of course, a ridiculous idea. We have our earthly families. We love our earthly families, and that's fine. The family of God does not replace our old family. If anything, it redeems it. It redeems these broken, dysfunctional families that we have. Because our dysfunction, our sin, our estrangement, the baggage that we carry with us, the grief that we experience this time of year, all of that is absorbed into this larger family of grace and of God's love. So that this is not the only option we have for family. This isn't the only family we count on. We have another family so that when this family goes bad, 
we still take joy in knowing that we are called a beloved child by someone, and that someone is God himself. Your world doesn't have to fall apart when your family does. When your family here goes through trials and difficulties, it's going to happen. It's okay. It's not easy, but it happens. You are part of a larger family. Quite frankly, you're part of a better family. Again, a family that's not being torn apart by sin, but a family that's being put back together by grace. And what that does to know that you're part of this larger family, it sets you free to not need your family here to be perfect. Does that make sense? When you're part of this other family, you don't need your siblings to ask for your forgiveness for what they said last year. You don't need certain things to happen before you'll like the people in your family. You don't need them to be perfect for you because they are not your savior. And you've stopped subconsciously asking them to be that. There's this distance that allows freedom to say, I'm part of the family of God. Now I can, I can work within this earthly family to love them and, and work for any reconciliation that might be possible. It makes it a little easier to forgive, to get along, to move on from those past hurts. It even makes it a little easier to deal with the grief. Because if you've lost a family member, this is a hard time of year. Isn't there some deep joy? And again, like I told the kids, it's better than just happiness. Isn't there a deep joy in knowing that you and this loved one you've lost are still part of the family of God? And when our families here are doing relatively well, We've forgiven and worked for reconciliation and all that. When things are going pretty well, isn't that a great sign to the rest of the world and to us of what God's family is like? Doesn't it give witness to when our families work well, if this is great, just imagine how great God's family is. <coughs> That's the purpose of our families when they are working well. So Christmas is God's offer to you and to me of a new family through Jesus Christ. All who believe in Jesus' name become children of God who stand to receive the same inheritance that Jesus has already received, the inheritance of eternal life in Him. And there is a place for you in this family, regardless of what family structure you were born into. Regardless of what your family looks like here, you are part of this family of God. There is a place for you in it. So no matter what dysfunction or grief <coughs> awaits you this Christmas when you get together with whatever family you have, may you find joy. May you find joy in knowing that you have a family in Christ. And may all of us do our very best to make everyone we meet feel like Him. In the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.